welcome folks to the TransitCon Yellow Line Room. Uh, I'm Austin Wu. You can find me on Twitter at the Austin Wu. And for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be going down the path of an interurban railway in the Midwestern United States as a case study of what was lost when these trains were dismantled over the course of, 20th, of the 20th century, and perhaps what hints they could hold for a better future for public transportation in the United States. So what I'd like to start everything off with is just this short passage to think about. Um, this is a section of a presentation by Jennifer Kiesmat um, from a conference in the United Kingdom in 2019. Um, she was the chief city planner in Toronto, Canada from 2012 to 2017 and a noted advocate for what we'd consider to be the good stuff here. Um, greater density, highway removal, transit corridors, and she stated the following, uh, that technology won't save us. Um, sorry, AVs. Uh, innovations are not required, and solutions we seek for the future can be found in principles of the past. So, well, um, so I'd like folks to just kind of tuck that in the back of their minds and think about maybe uh, meditate on that um, as we go down the line. Um, so if we think about um, interurbans, maybe one of the questions you might ask is, what are these? I've never seen one before. And you're correct. They don't really exist anymore in the United States. Um, they first originated in the 1880s um, when electric traction technology was new. And there's a need to improve transportation service to rural communities. So they ended up serving somewhat as a cross between a streetcar and an intercity train. So heavier than a streetcar, uh, but smaller than what we consider to be a conventional train. Um, to connect larger cities to uh, smaller towns or mid-sized cities, especially throughout the Northeast and Midwest. Um, and a lot of these lines developed rapidly um, in the first couple decades of the 20th century, to the point where by 1917, there's um, kind of this folklore that it was theoretically possible to travel all the way from Chicago to Boston and almost entirely on interurbans. Uh, that there are so many networks that had that were so interconnected that you could hop from train to train all the way from Lake Michigan to the Atlantic coast. Um, however, by the 1920s and 30s, competition from cars, um, poor finances from rapid inspection, because um, most of these, almost all of them were run by private companies, and a lack of support for these lines compared to federal subsidies for highway construction sent most out of business to the point where there's only three interurban in service in the United States today that I'm aware of. Uh, the Indiana High, South Shore Line by Chicago, the CTA Yellow Line also in Chicago, and the SEPTA Norristown High Speed Line uh, by Philadelphia. So if folks that are at war of any more, um, feel free to drop them in the chat as, uh, as well. Um, just to get a visual sense of what these were, um, here's on the left, we have a map from 1911. Um, showing the construction of interurban at that point in time, we see scattered all across the Midwest. Um, and then on the right, some pictures of interurbans. We have one, the, a very classic one from Bellefontaine, Ohio in 1908, uh, the South Shore Line in 2009. And then as well on the bottom, we have an interurban in Kyoto, Japan, um, or around um, nearby. Um, just in 2020. So it's kind of sense like maybe an alternate universe where public transit in the United States wasn't systematically dismantled. Um, what that might look like today. And the interurban that we're going to be talking about in particular, uh, the Crandick, is actually on this 1911 map. It is right. Um, mouse, it's right here. Um, so a brief history of this one in particular. Um, it was established in 1904 under the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City Railway and Light Company, um, which initially offered intercity passenger, streetcar, and freight services, um, with the latter comprising the bulk of revenues. Um, in 1936, they had a very interesting solution to this perennial last mile issue, public transit. You know, you take the train to the station, but most people don't live next to the station. Where do you go? Their solution in 1936 was to offer an additional taxi service door to door, um, which increased ridership by 60% and revenues by 11% in their first year, uh, which I think is really interesting to see so far back people already coming up with these solutions. Um, ridership peaked 
with 32 daily trips and speeds up to 90 miles per hour. During the Second World War, it missed rationing, um, rationing of both fuel and rubber for cars. Uh, but post-war prosperity, um, and then again, that government support for, um, for automobile infrastructure, which didn't exist for trains, um, resulted in a sharp drop of ridership. Um, so drastic, in fact, that passenger services ended um, less than a decade later in 1953. Um, to the best of my awareness, Crantic initially operated a replacement bus franchise, which was later discontinued as well. Um, but what's really interesting about the Crandic is that not only did it stay in service for passengers longer than a lot of others, that the company still exists today. There's still a Crandic railroad in this in eastern Iowa, um, albeit it's a diesel exclusive freight railroad, but its right away is still preserved. The work, the shops are still preserved, um, and that's driven a lot of the discourse behind the train uh, today. So taking a look at where this is situated ge geographically, if you came into here not really knowing where this was, not really knowing where Iowa was, it's okay. Um, we can see it in proximity to um, Chicago. Um, on, the on the left, we have a map from the 19 from around 1940, um, showing also it in relation to um, various intercity railroads across the Midwest that are almost all defunct today. Um, as well as what it actually looks like um, it, geographically. Zooming in a bit more on the actual places where it serves the Cedar Rapids Iowa City corridor, um, the Crandic line is about 27 miles in length um, and connects various institutions uh, between these two cities together. Um, the various industrial sites, especially for grain processing and other agribusiness, uh, three general hospitals, as well as the state flagship research university. Um, it's, uh, these are the second and fifth largest cities in the state, respectively, and one of the few areas in the state with consistent population growth in the current day. Um, if you're wondering why I care about this area so much, um, it's because I grew up here. Um, I grew up in Cedar Rapids and went to school at the University of Iowa, so completely contained within this grand corridor. Um, it's a big part of the local lore, um, of like, um, I don't know, a mixture of transit advocates and, and old-timey train fans who are like, um, I don't reminisce about this. Um, so moving on, so, but now today, this has been out of service for a while. Um, if you're asking how would someone move between these two cities in the current day without a car, uh, maybe they're not, young, they're not old enough to drive, maybe they're not able to, maybe they can't afford a car. There is a commuter bus that exists today that's run by uh, the local governments. But there are some key differences between this and the Crandic, which we'll see very soon um, after this 1940 timetable. Um, so this is a sense of where the train um, ran around 1940 as well. Um, as you can see, service starting very early in the day and ending fairly late at night. Um, and compare this to this commuter bus that runs today. Um, the propulsion for the Crandic was completely electrified, whereas this bus runs on diesel fuel. Um, in the past, where electricity was almost entirely generated by coal, maybe this doesn't really matter environmentally. Uh, but in terms of um, conversion to cleaner sources, it would have been a lot easier to do this with this Crandic into urban in 1940. Um, both of them start service around the same time, but crucially, the interurban runs a lot later at night. Um, there's stories of people being able to go out to shows or entertainment, um, night classes, and then move um, and then take train back to the other city. Um, that's simply not possible today. This commuter bus is very much made for conventional nine to five commutes. Um, the Crandic Interurban had weekend service, the commuter bus does not. Um, and in a trip time of about an hour, it had more than double the stops plus this uh, plus request stops in this optional taxi service mentioned. None of these services really exist for the commuter bus. Um, the Crandic Interurban did have frequent grade crossings and mixed with freight traffic, um, but it still had more dedicated right away with the bus, which is absolutely none at all. Um, and the Crandic was able to do this with the regional population of less than a third of um, what happened today. So even with all more people, even with uh, all this economic development and the intervening time, um, we actually see regression in the public amenities offered. 
Uh, the only place where the bus really wins out is complimentary Wi-Fi, um, as uh, Wi-Fi did not exist in 1940. Um, so what we're going to do next is kind of take a deeper look at the path of the line that um, it went also, through. The bus also has real-time tracking, which I don't think they had in 1940. So there's another amenity. No, they did not have real-time tracking. Yeah, although I'll say it only works some of the time. Um, so one thing that I found very puzzling when I was when I was doing research for this is that um, there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of folklore, a lot of historic photographs of, of the Crandic line, but there didn't seem to be like any comprehensive information about where the stations were actually located. Um, and so um, for some writing for a local newspaper, um, I made this interactive map, which I'll link at the end of this presentation, and I'll put in the Slack channel as well. Um, that I believe is the first publicly accessible comprehensive look at where all the old stations of the line actually work. So we're going to start at the terminus north in Cedar Rapids. Um, as where the arrow is pointing to is the terminus in downtown Cedar Rapids. This is actually very close to where the commuter bus parks today. So I mean, some things just don't change. Uh, but one thing I'd like to point out is in this photograph from 1949, um, in the back in this brick building, um, can folks see the mouse cursor? Um, this is the city's Union Station, um, which was its primary intercity train station out of three in the area. Um, it was demolished in 1961 and replaced with two parking garages, which still stand to this day, uh, which is, and again, one of these very sad stories about uh, urban development in the Midwestern US. Um, but also we see that this it follows residential areas as well as industrial sites. I think it, this, this um, is part of the, um, the line's dual nature, both for both passengers and freight. Um, moving along to the um, middle section in between these two cities, I actually think this is the most interesting part. Um, even though these tracks were laid down over a century ago, I think the, there's still a tremendous amount of potential this, I believe this line holds for, for transit-oriented development. Um, we see it pass by a small town, uh, we see it pass by the regional airport, and we also see it pass by natural spaces as well. So we see the potential for public transit, not just to take place in urban areas, but also to connect small towns and uh, natural spaces together. Today, the commuter bus passes all through this. It will go through, it goes straight um, down the interstate, bypassing all these areas. Um, so I think it's, I think this is an example of like what could be or perhaps what was lost when, when this line was abandoned. Um, entering the suburbs of Iowa City, um, I'd like to highlight this as like one of these methods to determine where these stations were located. So what I have on the right is a Sanborn fire insurance map uh, from around 1933 to 48 um, of uh, what, was the, what was the time the state tuberculosis sanatorium um, in this town called Oakdale, which is now part of Coralville, um, where we see highlighted over here, the railroad right of way and, uh, and the old depot right there. So finding all these um, station locations was a mixture of triangular map locations, um, these old fire insurance maps, and even uh, some personal inquiries um, of asking around of, of perhaps stories that people remember. Um, and again, I think we see some common themes begin to show up here. Um, this sanatorium is now, it's still state-owned land, and it's now the University Research Park. Um, and so we see the potential for this train to connect um, the downtown campus, the school, um, with, some, uh, with uh, some of its other satellite functions, as well as, a, as well as suburbs that have been sprawling in their own right, but are still more or less centered along this railroad line. Um, so finally entering into Iowa City, um, we see the connectivity that this um, train has with the university campus, um, with the downtown, and, and also, again, this potential that the line has for a transit-oriented development corridor that, um, as quite frankly, for the past 70 years or so, has been completely, uh, completely ignored. Um, and moving on, um, it's a brief intermission. Um, I know this is discussion about trains, but I haven't had too many pictures of them quite yet. Um, right on the on the right, we see an advertisement from around 1950 that has that advertises the taxi service 
um, a university campus map from 1950 showing us a little cartoon, and as well as waiting university students um, in Cedar Rapids from 1947 waiting to head south. So, you know, and I think one thing that someone might ask um, right here is like, if this train was so great, if everyone loved it so much, if everyone has all these like nice mementos about it, um, how come folks haven't you know, brought it back? To which I say, people have been talking about this for a long time. Um, to the best of my awareness, at least the past 14 years. Um, and immediately, if we look at these capital costs here, um, this immediately segues into this perennial question we have with public transit. This is nice and all, how are you gonna pay for it? Um, and one thing I'd like to note here is that even with these advantages that I mentioned earlier, this pre-existing track, preserved right of way, uh, these construction costs are all over the place. In 2006, um, we have a partial resurrection from Iowa City to the Air Force, so maybe about two thirds of the way. Um, adjusted for inflation today, estimated cost from $50 million. Identical path in 2017, we have a $300 million range of 300 to nearly $700 million um, I don't actually, I don't have the best answer where this, where, where these like variations come from, but, um, what I do know is that Elon Levy, who spoke earlier, um, today, I think, uh, their recording should be on YouTube, um, after this, con after this conference concludes, has talked a lot about this kind of cost disease in Anglo-speaking countries that like the U.S., Canada, U.K., Singapore, in the past couple of decades, Building transit has just gotten really expensive for all sorts of various reasons. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind um, with these kind of like who will pay for it is that there seems to be systemic issues in this regard um, that are not present everywhere in the world. So um, not inherent to transit, but maybe a classic America, US, Canada problem. Um, I think also one thing to keep in mind that we'll analyze a little further is funding formulas for, ver for transportation projects notably interstates versus transit. Um, what we have here is in the United States per the Federal Highways Act, a 90-10 federal split for interstate highways, whereas at best case, after running through a very competitive grant process, um, transit costs are usually split 50-50 between the federal government and local governments. Um, we can actually compare this very well with what's happening with local interstates in this area, so I-380 and I-80. Um, where there is a new interchange being built here with widening ongoing um, around this area, this impacted area. The estimated total cost here is around $632 million. And using our trusty, trusty 9010 formula, uh, suggests a federal tab of 569 million versus state tab of 63.2 million. If we compare this with a mid-range estimate for a commuter rail system, um, a 50-50 split suggests only 297 million from the federal government with 297 million from various undefined local entities. So not just the state DOT, but also local governments. And it results in this very curious case where the passenger rail system, which is less expensive than the highway, um, ends up having higher local costs due to these funding formulas. Um, and I think here, this is a very stark example of how public policy in the United States continues to favor car infrastructure over public transit. Um, that you can say, yes, to, um, to some extent, the interstate highway is, is less expensive than, than the commuter rail at the very direct local level, but this is kind of a penny-wise dollar foolish level, um, level of analysis, because uh, it doesn't look at the whole aggregate cost as well. And strict dollar-wise, the costs of prioritizing car infrastructure um, has much deeper ramifications that never happen with the train. If we look at what happened in Iowa City, we have highlighted in red, uh, the Crandig Bridge, um, actually here and here, just to anchor ourselves. Um, and in just a couple decades after the Crandig was taken out, um, the city was carved up in this urban renewal phase um, where we see the whole entire downtown just carved up for seas of parking. Uh, the university campus is here. Um, but compared in just a couple quick decades, um, how, much how much space for people was removed in favor for parking cars. Um, in, the, in the state of uh, in Cedar Rapids, this was much more aggressive. Um, I-380, when it went through the city, um, demolished this historically Hispanic neighborhood called Little Mexico. Um, 
if you drive past this area today, you'll see on the right hand side some some churches, a Masonic lodge with no residence or neighborhood around to speak of, which looks kind of peculiar. Uh, the reason why is the highway destroyed that neighborhood. Um, and so I think something I'd like to make clear here is that the destruction of American cities for cars didn't take place just in Chicago, in St. Louis, in Seattle, in these big cities, but it also took place at a smaller scale in these smaller cities as well. Um, and I'd like to end today on a hopeful note. Um, there's been some recent reporting just in the past few weeks about local governments talking about reviving the Cranick Landing part of Iowa City. Um, this is the fifth feasibility study in 16 years, so it's almost like a local meme that's like, people are going to bring it back to interurban, and then nothing happens afterwards. Um, I'd like to say that like I'm cautiously optimistic about this, but even so, compared to the old lines, this will be using non-electrified diesel cars, um, so not as good for the environment. It'll be removed at a slower speed. It is only going to connect up to the northern suburbs of Iowa City, so limited connectivity. Um, and it's going to end earlier in the night, too. So again, if we think about this kind of like late night service, replace your car entirely, be able to live the full faculties of life with transit, not possible quite yet, even with this proposal. Um, some concluding notes. Um, if we think about what is good climate action um, in terms of transit, getting people out of cars, getting people onto transit, moving around, um, and things that facilitate walkability. Um, climate action doesn't need to have flashy gimmicks. So sorry, Elon Musk, but like some of these principles have been established for over a century. Uh, and I think this, this provides a pathway to say like, this doesn't need to be entirely novel. We've done this kind of stuff before. Um, another frequent retort out here in the Midwest is that, oh, you know, public transit is nice, but we're not Chicago, we're not New York. We can't do good public transit. I don't think that's true either. Uh, public transit has and can connect rural and natural spaces with urban areas, and that principles of placemaking and transit-oriented development can similarly take place at a smaller scale. Um, see, I'm running out of time on leave space for questions, um, so I'm going to leave this back at the beginning. Um, I'm going to wrap this up, um, and we think about the solutions that we seek for the future can really be found, I think, in, in principles of the past, and that we'll, what we've done to the built environment right now doesn't have to be set in stone. Um, I'm gonna leave some time for people to screen cap some links to further reading. Um, I'll try to drop these links down in the Slack channel for the yellow line as well. Um, and now I will um, open it up for questions.